Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Our guest today is quite fascinating. She grew up in a rural area of Northern England, studied experimental psychology, then went into business. Now she holds board and advisory positions with several agri-tech companies, including Crop Health and Protection. She serves as the CEO of her own company, PBS International. She's the president of the National Plant Breeders Association, and she's a podcast creator. Welcome, Hannah Senior. Hello, thank you for having me with you today. Thanks for being with us. Hannah, we like to start out of left field here at the Computomics podcast. You're not only obviously highly skilled and accomplished, but you also seem to have a broad range of interests. So I was wondering, what's the latest thing you learned or experienced that inspired you or fascinated you? Ah, wow, that's a good question. Um, well, I am about halfway through a book called Braiding Sweetgrass um, by somebody called Robin Wall Kimmerer. And that is fascinating. She's um, an indigenous um, Native American and or has Native indigenous American um, ancestry. And she's writing about an altern her alternative perspective that she inherited of how she thinks about the natural world. So she's, mm -hmm. she's an ecologist and a, and a plant scientist by training, but she's blending that with a Native American perspective on how we think about the natural world and what that gives us. And that has been just the most mind expanding, um, fascinating perspective. So I'll go with that as my, as my, this is something <laughs> I've been learning. <laughs> I love that. That's super great. I mean, we have, we have a book recommendation right to, to uh, right off the bat to start us out with. Um, and I, I can totally see how that would fascinate you because perspectives, different perspectives play such a big role, both in your career and in the different roles you take. One of them is the uh, founder and CEO of PBS International. Um, how, how did you get in, involved in that? How did you come to founding that company? Well, actually, so I will um, admit from the off that I didn't found the company. I acquired it. Um, My so, bad. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So um, so I, I um, had, as you mentioned, a background that was more commercial. It was in business. And I had reached a point where... I wanted to, instead of being um, in a very large corporate, I wanted to be doing something more entrepreneurial, be running my own business. And I had an idea that I wanted to acquire a business to run rather than um, having a particular idea or a passion that I wanted to pursue by founding something. Um, so I had explored this, um, there's a, a mechanism called a search fund, which I explored, which um, backs general managers to go out and investors invest in the general manager to go out and find a company to acquire and grow. And I was thinking of doing that, but it turned out to be, um, it was in the middle of the credit crunch um, shortly after uh, I had that, that plan. Mm -hmm. oh, this isn't a great time for doing this. <laughs> um, so I, but I knew PBS International was a family connection and I started supporting the business and ended up acquiring it. So it was a commercial transaction, but that was the route in. Um, so the business did exist and I felt that there was a great opportunity to develop what already existed and um, build on that platform. And what would you say is the, the mission of PBS International? What is it that you do or want to achieve? So we are passionate about the importance of plants and um, the role that plants have to play in so many of the issues um, that, that we face um, as, as humanity. So our role in supporting that is to help plant breeders do their jobs better, giving them the very best tools so that they can eliminate one source of variability and do their jobs better. And that's where our pollination bags and tents come in. So they are um, very technical products, really. They're, they're very tailored to particular purposes, um, but that's how we want to be able to contribute. Mm -hmm. And can you maybe go a little more into what it is specifically? So these are type of fabrics that are used. Where do they help and why does it make sense to use them? 
<laughs> yeah, why? Good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so because in theory, um, anything that that controls pollen flows when it comes to crossing plants works just fine. You know, you could, and, and a lot of breeders do use plastic bags and paper bags with with success. Um, you know, in theory, you could use a trash bag and that would do the job just fine. The mm -hmm. problem is often when you do those things, the plant isn't very happy underneath. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what we do is to bring together the, the knowledge and the understanding of the plants with the knowledge and the understanding of how can you manipulate or combine polymers and manufacturing techniques to get technical fabrics that have different properties. Mm -hmm. And so when you put those two worlds together, you start being able to come up with solutions like, huh, well, this is you know a 25 micron pollen grain that we're trying to exclude but we're covering the whole plant, which needs to be able to photosynthesize. So how do we make sure there's enough light and enough um, airflow and gas exchange, but we can also keep out those pollen grains? What do we, how do we go about achieving that by man manipulating the polymers, the mm. manufacturing techniques, the shape of the fibers, et cetera? Hmm. That sounds like you need a lot of cross-disciplinary input to get to that point how what's the process of, of getting there for you yeah so well we have um i suppose like all businesses we have over time accumulated sort of an institutional instinct for where to go to start to solve the problem sometimes it's wrong but sometimes that <laughs> is a good place to start um but then we also have you know experts both within our team and sometimes beyond our team who we can turn to who can contribute specific pieces of knowledge or specific um uh, insights that help us to solve problems And then finally, we have to test, you know, we it's mm. we've learned through experience. This is not the kind of thing that you can do as a as a desk exercise. You have to develop what you think are the best solutions and then go trial them in the field, because mm. sometimes things don't work as you expect them to. You know, things that look great on paper just don't perform in the field. So I think it's that combination of, of approaches that works really well for us. Mm -hmm. How do you go about the the field testing? Do you have your own testing sites? Do you work with breeders or are you looking for partners to work with? We almost always work with partners um, and with breeders. And there's a combination of reasons for that. Partly it's because sometimes we're working on crops that we can't grow in the UK. You know, if we were growing I don't know, coconut palms in North Yorkshire. I mean, it would be a pretty bizarre <laughs> setup. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's things like that. Then there's also, it need, these products need to fit in with the practicalities of the work that's being done. Um, you know, if something's so incredibly delicate that it has to be handled in a very slow and specific way, it may not fit in with the practicalities of the the crossing operation or the seed production um, process. Mm -hmm. And so working with partners gives us that opportunity to make sure it's not only technically a good product, but also on a usability and, and practical level, it, it functions um, in addition. So we often start our, our product development process when somebody comes to us with a problem and says, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how to solve this because my plants are getting moldy under this, you know, mm -hmm. what I'm currently doing, or I need something bigger and I don't know how to solve that problem. And so, so often we start with a problem and then we get under the skin of, well, what are you trying to achieve? Why do you think this problem is occurring? You know, mm -hmm. how would you trade off these various um, criteria? And then that helps us to narrow down on, right, we think this might be the solution that would be the best one to try. It's pretty exciting. It's it's you always go back to almost like design principles of first understanding the problem. There is a problem, fully understanding the problem and then thinking about solutions and how they counteract as well. Because sometimes you think you have the solution and then you realize, oh, no, but this causes a new problem, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's an exciting process. And and also staying, you know, I mean, you have to all like, I think like so many walks of life, you have to stay open to the possibility that you won't solve the problem. Maybe they're mm. just, or or maybe, you know, maybe your solution um, isn't going to be cost effective. And so, you know, there's always this sort of process of walking through it um, 
recognizing that compromise has to be made. And sometimes those compromises um, are quite subtle and it's not it's not a, a big deal. And sometimes it can be quite a big compromise. And, you know, this this structure to be large enough then has to be made from a different material, which is stronger. Are you willing to make that trade off? You know, those kinds of things can be um, processes that have to be worked through. For sure. Um, I'd be interested. I mean, this is obviously one aspect or one area of technology where you're impacting plant breeding or, or the pollination process and that part of plant breeding. Um, what role do you see for technology in general in the plant breeding business or market? So I'm really excited about the opportunity for bringing technologies into agriculture um, and into food production and fiber production more generally. We have in agriculture a huge history of that, going back to, you know, um, the invention of the wheel, for example, is is thought to be associated with the development of agriculture. Um, but so there's always an opportunity to bring new technologies into the way that we do things. That being said, I also think we have to stay alert to the possibility that sometimes the problems aren't technical, they're about human organization. And again, it comes back to this thing about trying to work out what's the best tool for the job. Is it a technology that can make things more efficient or more sustainable? That's brilliant. Let's do that. Or is it actually a different question entirely, which is around how are we organizing it or what is the system that this sits within? Um, and so, you know, just being a little bit open minded to those possibilities is also a useful thing to bear in mind when we're getting so excited about our <laughs> latest shiny technologies. Very good point, for sure. Uh, just staying, staying open to all possibilities and also interrogating how they might interact with each other. I think that's that's uh, certainly the way to go. Um, speaking of organization, <laughs> yeah, in August of 2020, you became the president of NAPB, the National Association of Plant Breeders. Can you just give a quick summary? What's the role of this organization in agriculture? Sure. Um, so NAPB is an American organization. It's this, a scientific society that represents the interests and activities of plant breeders. Um, so our role is to represent plant breeding in all its guises and plant breeding adjacent um, discipline. Mm -hmm. So that would include things like... Um, advocacy to to raise awareness of what plant breeding does and why it should be funded and deserves long-term investment. Um, it can include things like raising awareness for the next generation of plant breeders so that they understand what a career in this industry might look like and and perhaps dispel some myths about what a career in this in this sector might look like. Um, it includes things like networking and mentoring so that whether you're a new entrant, or you've been in the industry for a long time, you have the opportunity to meet with and learn from other people um, who are doing similar similar work, but perhaps in a different context or in a completely different species. And I think that's one of the things I love about NAPB is that um, it really does represent the diversity of plant breeders. So we have, you know, Plant breeders who are, for example, representing the organic community, and we have plant breeders who are representing the biotechnology or um, or work with the big multinationals who also do agrochemicals and see that as part, part of the package. Mm -hmm. um, we work with plant breeders who represent row crops, like they work in soy and corn and things like that, mm -hmm. right down to incredibly niche things like Kernza, you know, developing native perennials to be um, grain crop or hazelnuts or characterizing types of vanilla. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. incredible the range of species and, and plants that are, that would be represented within the NAPB community. Um, so, yeah, so it's a really exciting organization to be involved with. You, you are the first NAPB president from outside of North America. How did you get involved? I mean, obviously, you're <laughs> super passionate about it, as we just heard. But but uh, how how did you how did you end up in this position? To answer the question about how I got involved in NAPB, it's helpful for me to just take a step back and explain something that I omitted when I was talking about PBS International. Mm -hmm. 
Because what we do at PBS International, designing, making these pollination bags and tents is so specialist. The implication is that our customers are all over the world. So, so we really are an international business. We export to, to every continent, I think, except Antarctica. Um, so we spend a lot of time with customers in the US. And I went to an NAPB conference um, several years ago because I wanted to understand, you know, what is this organization? Is this something that is relevant to us? Should we be involved? Should we be a member? Um, I found it to be an organization that I could get really um, enthused about and I could get very aligned with, which, you know, mm -hmm. you, you've already <laughs> detected. Um, but I also could see that um, bringing a sort of an international point of view to the organization, I'm not the only non-American member. There are other mm -hmm. people located outside the US. Um, but bringing in an international perspective would be valuable. And so I volunteered um, to participate in one of the committees, mm -hmm. the membership committee as it, as it happens. Um, and through being involved in the, the organization and as a volunteer, I then became, um, I suppose, more involved in and understood more about what was happening and how the organization ran and how I could add value. And then eventually over time, I was asked, would I be willing to put my name forward to be considered for the for the um, executive committee? And that was how I came to be president. So it's a it's a rotating process to mm -hmm. rotate through the executive committee and um and hence, this year, I am the president. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I mean, again, a story of, of kind of openness and, and involvement and just organically seeing where it goes. Um, you also, just in the beginning, when you, when you went into the role of NAPB, you covered such a huge, diverse ground of, of what NAPB is involved in. Um, do you have any specific area that is super important to you or aspirations that are focused in a specific area? Um, what, do you mean for the year that I'm involved as the president? Um, yes, for now, but obviously also long term. If you know, I'm, I'm assuming most of the most of the issues that you'd be focusing on wouldn't just be a short term issue. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, well, there's there's three themes that spring to mind as being particularly a focus. So. For me, this year as president, one of the things that I can bring to the party, it, because I come from a commercial background, is this sort of um, focus on how do we transition the organization through a bit of an inflection point that we're at. We are a volunteer organization, we've grown over time, and we're reaching a point now where we need to get some more structure in place. So we need to have um better defined systems and processes and communication methods because it becomes unwieldy and eventually volunteers get frustrated because they're spending their time you know the example i use is a lot is that they spend their time asking who's got the password for blah 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 <laughs> rather than being able to get on with the thing that they actually want to be doing right. um so so bringing my my experience from the commercial world into the organization that's something that I'm putting time and effort into to make sure we can run smoothly and then volunteers can put their energies into the things that they're really passionate about mm -hmm. not just making the wheels turn. So that's one piece. There's another piece um that again I feel very passionately about given my um my interest in and enthusiasm for an international perspective which is connecting up NAPB with other plant breeding organizations around the world. Um, so, you know, we have Eucarpia in Europe. Um, there is the African Plant Breeding Association. So how do we start to create dialogue between those different organizations? Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what will come out of that, but I can see that having the opportunity to create those those conversations will yield benefits because plant breeding is such an international pursuit. And so mm -hmm. many plant breeders do move around different countries. They benefit from understanding how their work impacts different parts of the world. You know, there's, there's a huge um, potential gain from creating the opportunity for dialogue there. So that's another area that's really dear to my heart. And then the third area is around advocacy. So this fits into both communication and advocacy in the, I suppose, more 
political and and funding guises. Um, so so I think there is generally a misunderstanding about what plant breeding is and how important it is to achieving our goals around sustainability and food security. And that would be the case anyway, but especially given the impacts of climate change are coming thick and fast. You know, we really do need to make sure that we're investing in, in new varieties, in plant genetics, in understanding plant science, if we want to be able to feed ourselves and look after the planet going forward. So, so raising awareness of what plant breeding does means communicating about the process, about success stories, but also, and this is where it's particularly relevant to what's going on in the US, um, 2023 is a farm bill year. So every five years, the farm bill rolls around. Mm -hmm. So making sure that legislators, decision makers, when investment decisions and, and allocation decisions are being made, understand why agricultural research and particularly plant breeding is important. That's another piece of work that we're really working hard on. Mm -hmm. Again, quite a broad range that you're covering. Uh, let me just follow up on the the um, the second era you mentioned, which was the international networking and kind of fostering that dialogue between uh, different organizations across the planet. Um, do you have anything particular in mind, events or or networking structures that you can share already? At this is very early days. We mm -hmm. have just started to um, bring some of those organizations together and we have a quarterly conversation, which, by the way, is an absolute nightmare to schedule because everybody's <laughs> <laughs> totally different time zones. Oh, I can um, imagine. But but we've we've started to have that conversation. Um, but I think we want to take it slowly to make sure that everybody feels like there are benefits to be had and it doesn't degenerate into a talking shop. Um, mm -hmm. so we we would rather start with few people and few organizations and build trust. And then once we have a nucleus, we can add to that rather than starting Big Bang and then right. not managing to keep everybody engaged. Definitely sounds like the sustainable, more sustainable way to go. Um, and so you also mentioned in like the that third area of advocacy that it really depends about on communication, on making people aware, whether it be legislators or the general public of the importance of plant breeding, agriculture, and what we need to do there, um, which leads me to another area that you're very active in. You created and host the, the Plant Breeding Stories podcast, which is uh, well into its fourth season now. <laughs> um, why? I mean, you do so much. Why did you start that podcast on top of all of the things that you're doing? <laughs> yeah, good question. I asked myself <laughs> that as well. <laughs> um, it was really a reaction to um, the COVID situation. That was that was the the spark that made it actually go from an idea to something that we did. Um, we were, you know, we couldn't travel, we couldn't visit customers and talk to customers in the way we normally would. So we were thinking about, well, how do we keep in contact? So that's that was the first thing that that turned it from an idea into action. But then there were two other pieces that pre preceded that. One was a general sense that people didn't necessarily understand what plant breeding, plant breeding is and what plant breed, breeders do, but there were misunderstandings. Um, you know, there is a bit of a sense of, oh, it's all dominated by evil big business or, mm. um, you know, people are using these technologies and they're irresponsible and they're going to cause all this irrevocable damage. And I felt that that wasn't consistent with the plant breeders that I knew who were almost always or without exception, thoughtful, careful people who are trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this would be an opportunity to share some perspectives from individuals who work in this field about why are you doing this? What do you what do you want to achieve? Um, so, so I think it was that. And then I suppose, um, finally, plant breeders are on average, quite modest people in my experience <laughs> and, and don't mm. necessarily, you know, sing, sing the praises mm. of the work that they do. And this seemed like a good opportunity to do that. So, <laughs> so it was a combination of reasons. There were a, com a combination of ideas and then the, the COVID situation sort mm -hmm. of sparked it into 
let's give this a go. Yeah, because suddenly you have you, you maybe have a little more time or also you need to find solutions for for the spaces that you do, now don't have anymore. I love that. Um, you said so many different perspectives, maybe people that we don't hear from too much uh, in, in a lot of other areas. Uh, how has that work shaped the way you think about your other areas of work? So I think before doing Camp Reading Stories, I would have said, yes, diversity is important and diversity of perspectives is important. But it was quite an abstract concept, whereas doing plant breeding stories really underlined for me lots of examples of why it's important. Mm -hmm. So people bringing different backgrounds or skills or technologies into plant breeding and that enriching and diversifying the, the tools in the toolbox to solve problems. Um, people talking about how they defined the problem that they were trying to solve. I mean, there was um, there was somebody I spoke to who talked about understanding um, or realizing that the amount of time that it took for beans to cook was hugely variable. And that meant that when you're talking about smallholders who are spending a lot of their time cooking beans as their staple food, it's wasting fuel, it's wasting time, it's having an impact on their health. It's like, oh, that's never, I've never heard people talk about that before. That's massive. It also has implications for processing, you know, yeah. if you want to can beans. But that that point of view hadn't been brought forwards. Mm -hmm. And so for me, there were all these examples of, of insights where I thought this is really powerful by listening to different stories. We can build a much wider view of what's possible in terms of tools and techniques that can be used, but also we can refine and have a much more nuanced view of what do we want to achieve and why. For sure. I mean, I was going to ask you for a specific example. You just gave it, I think. And if the listeners could see you, they'd see the lights <laughs> um, even even more than just just hearing them. Uh, massively inspiring. I, I totally agree. And I find even here with the Computomics podcast, it's kind of similar because we have so many different perspectives uh, that you really, it really makes you, it's not just interesting, it really makes you think about things differently because suddenly you have a different perspective, a different, a problem you hadn't even ever thought about and that suddenly makes you look at your work your everyday differently and you come to different places to different solutions by doing that yeah exactly and we're trained for very good reason as we go through our education to to solve problems in a very reductionist way you know simplify this problem down mm -hmm. what is it that we're trying to find out right define the problem these are the inputs solve the problem job done But actually, most re real world problems, especially at this point in our development, <laughs> are much more complicated and you can create unintended consequences, mm -hmm. unintended negative consequences by only taking that reductionist point of view. You know, to give you a really crude example, it's sort of reducing plants down to, oh, well, you just need a seed and NPK and water. Job done. Mm -hmm. um, Well, actually, it doesn't work like that, does it? Because then we start we start understanding better the soil microbiome or we start understanding problems that you have with runoff or, you know, what does that mean for, um, I don't know, nutrient density and all sorts of consequential problems. It's just more complicated. So recognizing that these problems are more complex and we need to not reject those reductionist tools that we used, but complement them with other tools that help us to understand a more complex systems perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, that's how you turn it from being not just a talking shop or a, um, hey, look at all these great ideas I've, I've harnessed and, <laughs> and collected like little trophies, but you start being able to turn it into, this is how I'm going to apply this to achieving the goals that I want to achieve. Amazing. I could talk to you for another 
hour or two at least. <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm afraid. But you've got other things to do. <laughs> uh, we, we all do. and uh, we, we all do. Yeah, but I, I do hope maybe that you will be back. Um, it was so exciting to to hear, uh, you know, for, for starting from your book recommendation, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, to the way you kind of went into your process with uh, PBS International Pollination Bags and Tents that you create and how you're working with NAPB uh, to, to address these big areas of uh yeah of development i guess of, of getting the organization to a new point to this and i to me that's kind of the overall theme is really about you know trying to to be open trying to really take in different perspectives and not get to a reductive point i guess with how we try to approach solutions that i'm really taking away from this thank you so much for your time hannah and i hope you will be back for everyone out there listening um please do go to computomics.com. We will have some show notes so you don't have to scribble down all the interesting <laughs> facts and uh, and inspiring thoughts that Hannah just gave us. Um, you can just go to the site and click on the links there. And yeah, uh, hope you will be back next time uh, with another great guest. And Hannah, hopefully you will be back too. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. It sure has. Thank you all. Thank you.